It was the following Saturday, the first day of all summer-long freedom, and the plan was to spend the whole of it at Beaucur. Slow down, Catfish ordered Leanne as she capped him the gremlin the last few river road miles. To their left, outside Leanne's car window, the levee rolled along at eye level like the back of a sleeping python, while to the right, yellowish-green rectangles of corn and high grass undulated between clusters of tiny red brick homes with the occasional dilapidated plantation house playing hide-and-seek in the shadows at the end of a dwindling live oak trail. I said slow down, Catfish reiterated, and Leanne failed to comply promptly enough. What for? asked Leanne. She was anxious to get to Beaucur before the dark clouds piling up south of the river became a reason not to. Because there's something I want to see, Catfish replied. Grumbling, Leanne let up on the gas pedal. Slower, Catfish directed. What are we looking for, <coughs> Leanne asked. Catfish ignored the question. Just a little further, he said. A little further. Stop! But stop the car! Leanne hit the brake. And before the tires could complete their last gravel-crunching revolution, Catfish was outside the gremlin and traipsing into a grassy field. Leanne threw open her door. Where are you going? She called out after him. Catfish oared an arm over his head. Leanne groaned, then plucked a roach out of the ashtray, fired it up, and took a long hit, her first of the day. Normally, this was done on her way to pick up Catfish, but this morning she'd been so focused on pulling things together she held off. Holding the smoke in, she peered over the back seat and ran through the list yet again. Sandwiches, beach towels, mosquito spray. Yep, it was going to be a good day, provided they didn't get rained out. She glowered at the cloud cover while absorbing another dose, then hopped out of the car and plowed into the field. Already, Catfish was about a third of the way across, and if the cliff he was moving, that would have been double had he been cutting a straight swamp. Instead, he was zigzagging back and forth on grass that was knee-high on him and waist-high on Leanne. Scorched white at the tips, the blades of grass were paper-cut sharp, and between Leanne's forward motion and the river wind whipping the high grass against the tender backs of her knees, Leanne was about to broadcast a complaint when she saw Catfish go down. Hey, she called out, are you okay? I'm fine, he called back. Over here. Where? Here. About 20 yards ahead, a hand rose out of the grass. A minute later, Leanne was standing next to where Catfish sat, the mashed down grass a chubby cushion beneath him. He had on cutoffs, and one of his knees was skinned and leaking blood, but he wasn't paying that any mind. What commanded his attention was the kneecap height that he bumped into, a marble statue of a little boy bearing a wreath. It's still here, Catfish said with a brusque mix of satisfaction taste, glancing up at Leanne. What is, she asked, remarking the jagged tips of the angel's wings and thinking that if catfish had been advancing from the other direction, they might be dealing with a gash instead of a scrape. Then the wind came through, as long and low and heavy as a salt water wave and with a similar hush. And when it did, Leanne gasped, because in that moment the grass lay down as flat as if the field had been plowed, jutting up around them like dinosaur bones out of the earth or grayish white tombstones. They're all still here, said Catfish, his voice barely separate from the wind. Having just caught the buzz, Leanne gawked speechlessly at the stones as the grass gradually straightened, coming back up not all at once, but in fits and starts determined by the ebb and flow of the wind. And like the grass, Catfish rose not right away, but in his own time. What is this place, Leanne said, when he was at last fully vertical. Catfish spit on his hand and rubbed it into his knee. One of the family graveyards, he said. One of them? There's a bunch. I mean, there were. I don't know how many there still are. The mausoleum was just for the immediate family. Leanne squatted next to the angel and pushed the grass back from its foot high base. Robert Pierce Beaucur, 1811 to 1814. Weep not, mother and father, for me. I am waiting in glory for thee. <coughs> wow, said Leanne. He was only three. So what, Catfish said. Leanne glanced up at him. He'd only said two words, but there was something in them the economy amplified, something at once foreign and familiar Leanne couldn't put her finger on. Then she did. 
Catfish sounded exactly like Tess did whenever she troubled herself to address Leanne, icily devoid of emotion. Nothing, said Leanne, straightening up. It's just, you know, sad. It's sad, all right, agreed Catfish, but there was irony there. What do you mean? Catfish shrugged. Little Robert's father was Henry Beaucur. He was married to one of my great, great, great aunts. They weren't that rich. They only kept around a dozen slaves. And every now and then, when things got tight, as they sometimes did, since Henry very much enjoyed playing craps, they'd sell one. Nobody knew that better than Rose, the family cook, who'd already had two of her children taken when they came for the third. His name was Job. There's no angel for him. Catfish cut off abruptly and looked off into the distance, then up to the clouds swelling over the levee. It's going to rain, he said, his voice as parched as the grass. What happened? Prodded Leanne. Catfish glanced at her, then spun away. While speaking, he'd been surveying some interior landscape as the test like demeanor prevailed. But in that split second of contact, something flashed in his eyes, something Leanne knew he didn't want her to see and she wished she hadn't seen, but it was too late. Because in that moment, all the information that had been collecting inside Catfish, all those statistics and pictures and words, seemed to crystallize into knowing rush up his gullet, like a mob trying to exit a burning hall. And as Catfish did his best to keep the door bolted, his face contorted and twitched. Caught off guard, Leanne stood watching through partially lowered eyelids, mortified over being too stoned to know how to make whatever was happening to Catfish stop as he first bent forward and hugged himself, as if he had a bad stomach ache, and then notched down onto the ground. I'm so ashamed, Leanne, he said. The words came hiccuping out on a torrent of sobs that sounded like something inside him was being beaten and torn. I'm so ashamed, I don't know what to do. Leanne steered herself to him. It's okay, she said. It's okay. She placed a palm on Catfish's shoulder, as lightly as one would the first hair on a baby's head. And as she did, she realized how rarely they touched and how powerless doing so made her feel. It's not your fault, she told him. It's not. I know, Catfish gasped, but it's still in me. It's what made me. What am I supposed to do? I don't know, said Leanne, frantically trying to figure it out. Maybe, maybe we should just stop. Catfish sprang up, his anguish churning with rage. No, he protested. That's what they want. That's what they're counting on. Leanne stumbled back, almost tripping over a grave marker. Who, she said. Everyone, Catfish replied. Leanne shook her head. That's not true. No, Catfish demanded. No, answered Leanne, and it isn't fair either. There are lots of people who don't want that. Not in my family, said Catfish, kicking grass. What are you talking about, said Leanne, edging into annoyance. What about you? What about Catherine? That's who you're getting all this from, isn't it? She cared enough to choose to spend the last year of her life locked up in an attic. She cared so much she... Leanne caught herself. Anyway, in case you haven't noticed, I care. Catfish glanced up at Leanne, then out toward the roiling horizon. Another blast of wind, this one chilly, batted in the first raindrops as the last bolt of sunlight cleaved the ocean of sky. Leanne watched the monuments bob, then cleared her throat. We should go, she said. The silence stretched enough to make her wonder if Catfish was mad at her. Then he turned. Although his own squall had blown out as quickly as it had blown in, his cheeks were still shiny with tears, but there was no self-consciousness. Rather, he was back to being focused and calm, back in the eye of the storm, as if he'd poked his head out and yanked it back in. I know you care, Lee, he told her, and I'm glad you're here. But there's something you need to know. Okay. We're not stopping. Who said anything about stopping? Oh. Yeah, but, I mean, only because I know, said Catfish, and I appreciate it. I appreciate everything you're doing. If it wasn't for you, we wouldn't be here. But now that we are, now that we've started, I can't stop, Lee. Catfish shrugged, a desolate smile dimly lighting him up. I'm the last one, the last Beaucur, unless I have kids, which as you and I both know is probably not in the cards. I get it, Leanne assured him. Do you? Of course, you feel a responsibility. 
The smile burst wide open like the rising sun streaking across the horizon. Yes, cried Catfish, that's it. That's what I'm trying to say. I was meant to find those records. I've been chosen, Lee, he thumped his chest. Me, I've been given a chance to do something big, something important, just like Frederick's always talking about. I've been called upon to make things right for my family and for all those people my ancestors harmed. I don't know how yet, but I have ideas. I have so many ideas I feel like my head's going to spin off. Catfish took a few jagged steps one way, then reversed direction his hands directing an unwritten symphony as the words tumbled over each other. My family, well, you know, we've got money, and one day it'll be mine, and when it is, I'm gonna use it, Lee, every cent. I don't want it, knowing where it came from, just the thought of it makes me want to throw up. So I figure I can either burn it or put it to good use, and I'm gonna use it, Liam. I'm not crazy, I know I can't change the past, but with all that money, I can do a lot. I mean, we can. I want you to help me, Lee, I need you to. Anyway. Even though I don't even know where to begin, that's what I think about. I think about it all the time. Otherwise, the sun dimmed and flared again as Catfish came back to the here and now, planting himself in front of Leanne. So, he said, panting with exhilaration, what do you think? I think you're magnificent. No, I mean you're still in, right? Yes. Lightning smacked the levee and the sky opened up. Drenched in hooting, they were a few yards from the gremlin when Catfish made a U-turn back into the now what are you doing, Leanne hollered into the maelstrom. I'll be back in a minute, answered Catfish. Leanne opted to wait in the car with her roach. Some multiple of a minute later, the hatchback clicked open and something so heavy it caused the back of the gremlin to drop a few inches thumped onto the mat. Leanne twisted around, lying on its side, staring blindly at a brown paper grocery bag, was little Robert's angel. Leanne gaped at it, then redirected her gaze to the drowned rat that was Catfish Coker, oblivious to the rain lashing his back. He was sporting a smirk. You started it, he said. <laughs>